Hello, nerd. Primarchs are some of the most powerful beings in the galaxy, so it's no wonder that some idiots wants to steal their fame by impersonating them. You know these guys that tend to wear army uniforms acting like they served in the military, when in actuality they just got a good deal on eBay for a military outfit and couldn't contain their low self-esteem, so they decided to wear it just to feel better about themselves. Well, that is what kinda happened in the War of the False Primarch. Maybe it was one of the Fabius Bowles created clones deciding to have a shot at being a Primarch. Or maybe some Astartes chapter master got railed up on space cocaine and feeling invincible decided that he's a Primarch now. We won't really know that because the information is scarce. But what we do know is that to deal with this threat, High Lords of Terra selected five borderline insane Astartes chapters that just love to dig themselves in enemies' corpses. This pentarchy of blood has gone in Warhammer's history as the most brutal bunch of Astartes chapters, if the name didn't already give it away. In this video, we will explore the War of the False Primarch, what really happened during this conflict, and also every Astartes chapter from Pentarchy that was sent to come blast the traitors. So without further ado, let's dig in. There is only war. The most of the information that I could gather is that in total there were 11 Astartes chapters that sided with the False Primarch. It is quite bizarre that so many chapters suddenly joined the False Primarch, like what has to occur to make such a thing happen? The information is really scarce, but it opens doors to many speculations. Many people think that it could actually be one of the missing Primarchs returning, potentially the Second Legions, the Forgotten One. It would also explain why so many chapters suddenly joined his side against the Imperium, maybe because of the shared lineage or Primarch's charisma. But, as I was saying, it is just a speculation and these 11 chapters are expunged from Imperial records. So in the end you can make up your own theory about this one. But the fact remains the same, that the five of the bloodiest chapters were sent to eradicate these traitors and holy shit, they did their job well. Nothing was left after the conflict to remind about the Imperium's failure. Names of these chapters are well known. They were Flesh Eaters, Carcaradons, Charnel Guard, Death Eagles and Red Talons. I think it would be fair that I elaborated a bit more on these guys since the video is about them. So let's start with Flesh Eaters. Wrapped in the mystery and descended from Blood Angels, the Flesh Eaters chapter remains a bloody bunch. They've been kicking around since the end of 33rd millennia and are sons of the Sanguineous. These guys are especially haunted by Red Thirst, like now you kinda understand where does the name comes from. They are berserkers, enjoying spilling blood and cutting up flesh more than your local butcher. These guys actually practice all types of vampiric shit to the point of them being borderline heretic. If you haven't noticed, then it's kind of a theme with Blood Angel's successor chapters to drink blood, eat flesh, take blood showers, sucking on that bloody sausage, it's like they actively are trying to contract AIDS. Many actually thought them to be extinct because of their gene seed flaws and everyone was surprised that they showed up to protect Blood Angel's homeworld Baal when Tyranids were invading. At least a good thing going for them is the fact that they recently got Primaris reinforcements, which has, well, in a way, resurrected their chapter. The Charnel Guard, a shady bunch of Blood Angel's cousins keeping to themselves in the 41st millennia, born possibly during the third founding, they're like the distant relatives of the Blood Angels that they pretend not to know. These guys are like literal space vampires. When they're not out on a battle, they're locked away in stasis crypts. This is what allows them to keep constant chapter power because they don't even get to age by being awake constantly. Their armory is a treasure trove. They got relics from the Great Crusade you would only hear about in legends such as Fellblade Imperial main battle tanks, Fire Raptor gunships and other cool stuff. Zephon, the bringer of sorrow, was the first chapter master for the Charnel Guard and actually one messed up individual. This guy was like a blood angel on steroids, and not in a good way. He was suffering from a severe red thirst that he struggled to keep in check. During Great Crusade, he was blood angel's destroyer marine. They used some type of radiation and phosphex weaponry considered dishonorable by other Astartes. By doing so, he gained the nickname Bringer of Sorrow. As it is with blood angels, he was a vicious warrior but also an artist. Musician to be exact. In a fight against some type of Xenos, he lost both his arms, his left eye, knee and right foot. He survived and the lost limbs were replaced with cybernetics, though his body was constantly rejecting these augmentations, crippling his ability to fight and worsening his condition. Because of it, he fell into a deep depression and was sent to Terra to join Crusader Host, 
which was composed of Astartes from different legions. Because of Horus heresy, the Crusader host was disbanded and its members were imprisoned and interrogated to weed out the traitors. Afterwards, he was released to fight for the Imperium. Custodes recruited this guy to aid them in the secret war of the webway. He spent his days off together with Mechanicus techno-archaeologist Arkan Land, who made new cybernetics for him putting Zephon back on track. He used some type of AI device from Dark Age of Technology to trick Zephon's body to accept the cybernetics and it was a major success. Later on during the fighting he succumbed to the Black Rage but was able to pull himself out of it and once the fighting was done and legions were split up, he became the first chapter master of the Charnel Guard. In actuality, he is a legendary warrior that stood at the front of Eternity Gate with his Primarch Sanguinius, but his deeds are forgotten to the time. The Horus Heresy was a messed up cocktail of loyalty and betrayal. Some Astartes saw Horus as the golden boy, a better boss than the Emperor himself. Others stuck to the Emperor like a chewing gum to a shoe, caring more for the Imperium than their own Primarch's wishes. Ships vanished into the abyss, like ghosts in the night. Sure, some got stuck in warp storms or enemy beatdowns, but trust me, a few snuck off quietly, swapping sides like traders at flea market. Traitors backstabbing traitors? Why not? The Death Eagles, Emperor's Children's Leftovers, proudly sported their legion's colors. They squared off against their backstabbing brothers and then vanished like a bad dream. Guess their fate is just another entry in the galaxy's who the fuck knows collection. Now here's the twist. These Astartes hang around in the shadows using their gene seed and knowledge of technology to keep their numbers going. If these Death Eagles actually held from the Emperor's Children's loyalist side, the Imperium hid the truth deeper than a grave. I mean, imagine the embarrassment of being linked to the traitors. No wonder their legacy got buried in the darkest corner of Imperial archives. It would also make sense, because many Emperor's children Astartes were Terran-born nobles that were more loyal to the Emperor than their Primarch. The Red Talents have a history steeped in shadows of Horus Heresy. Born from the infamous Marugal clan company of the Iron Hands, these blood-stained warriors followed the lead of their unforgiving master, Autek Mor. He was both Iron Lord and Iron Father of the Tenth Legion, a guy with a reputation darker than the Void itself. Mor was a shady figure even before the heresy broke loose. Whispers floated about his gene seed that it wasn't even Iron Hands. A Terran by birth, he rode the early Great Crusade hype, making a name for himself as a ruthless weaponsmith and a generally not-so-friendly guy. Moore had a hobby of dueling his own legion members over the tiniest insults. He ruled his company like a grim dictator. No mercy, no breaks, no weakness. But it has always been like that with Iron Hands. His Morugal company was a trash bin for legion rejects and the most unstable crew around. I guess it suffices to say, Moore and his Primarch weren't exactly sending each other love letters. In the aftermath of Iron Hands' devastation on Istvan 5, some of their own plunged into madness, grappling with the trauma of witnessing their gene father's death, they embraced war as a twisted form of redemption. The Red Talons, under the command of Autek Mor, emerged as a force to be feared, targeting planet Gesamein in a relentless quest for retribution against the traitors. Gesamein, once a peaceful heaven, fell to Horus without resistance. The Red Talon, ship of Mor, a dark omen in black and crimson descended upon the planet like a harbinger of doom, their grand cruiser breaching the fences and mercilessly bombarding the surface. As the cities crumbled beneath the iron grip of clan Moragul, the Iron Hands left a grim legacy, a nuclear device planted within each major urban center. Traitors and those who had sided with them faced the wrath of Iron Hands ruthless justice. With Red Talon's departure, the cities erupted in nuclear fire, leaving a haunting message etched in the death and destruction. A warning that in this brutal civil war, there was no room for neutrality, only the merciless divide between loyalists and traitors. As you probably already understood, the chapter is called Red Talons because of their ship's name used by the Morogul clan and Otek Mor. In the wake of the Great Scouring, amidst the birth of successor chapters in the second founding, they emerged as the official chapter of Red Talons. These warriors were part of the Iron Hands Legion that were extremely volatile, bloodthirsty and predisposed to aggressive combat tactics. The scars of the Horus Heresy deeply etched themselves upon the Red Talons. Their unwavering thirst for vengeance against the traitor legions fueled their existence. 
They wanted to fuck shit up and the Imperium wouldn't stand in their way. Leading this relentless pursuit for justice was Iron Lord Autek Moore, ascending as the chapter master for this freshly minted chapter. And last, the Carcaradons. They are probably my favorite chapter ever. These guys are literal space sharks. No one really knows their lineage, even though many have stated they have Raven Guard gene seed. I disagree. I think they have a chimeric gene seed, maybe, which is a mix of Night Lords and Raven Guard. It would make more sense because these guys are stealthy, very silent, and when in combat, holy shit, they are brutal as fuck. Their chapter master Tybros is literally called the Red Wake because when he goes into battle, he leaves streams of blood from his enemies behind him. This dude is massive, probably the largest space marine to live. In the book Outer Dark, he made Tech Marine almost shit himself because of how huge and intimidating he is. What is really creepy, he speaks in a soft and silent voice. Imagine like a huge guy walking up to you and just saying, hey, how are you doing? That would scare shit out of me. And it doesn't help that he wears customized power armor made from parts of Dreadnought. Just look at him, he's a unit. In battle he wields two lightning claws which are called Murder and Slake. Except for the claws, they use fucking chainswords. Like what the hell, it's worse than Edward Scissorhands. Karkarodons enter battle in utter silence and leave in the same way. You will never hear them talk between each other and when the battle is done they will just quickly disappear. It's really hard to track them because they are a fleet based chapter resorting to looting gear. Some of their Astarte still wear some of the oldest pattern power armor dating back to the end of Horus Heresy. They get new recruits once in a while landing on Imperial worlds and gathering aspirants and slaves to work for the chapters. In this way they make sure that they are at the necessary power for engagements. I will go a bit on about them because this is really interesting. Let me put on my tinfoil hat. The chapter is under Edict of Exile which means they have exiled themselves until he, the Forgotten One, returns. Now, here's the kicker. The second Primarch is called the Forgotten One, and if you have seen my Primarch project video, then you know that there are sources that state that the second Primarch is very silent, just like Karkaradons are. What if they don't have a Chimeric Gene Seed, but that they are sons of the second Primarch? Just hear me out. The chapter itself distances itself from the Imperium because of the Edict. They are very secretive, and while they help out other chapters in battle, nobody really knows anything about their origins, just speculations. Also the fact that they are deeply loyal and even religious. Not Imperial cult type of religion, but Imperial Creed, the true religion of the Imperium before everything got screwed up. My mind is putting together a puzzle. The second Primarch is forgotten. It is never stated anywhere he was killed, just purged from Imperial records. Why? Exile? Secret mission? Karkaradons are waiting for the Forgotten to return, and only then their Edict of Exile will end. The fact that their Gene Seed makes them into silent gore machines when Second Primarch is also said to be a man of few words, and when he speaks it's silent and very direct, adds everything up. So you know what I think, Karkarodons are the true second legion, or remnants of it, keeping to shadows waiting for their Primarch's return. I think the forgotten Primarch was sent on a mission, or penance, that no one could know about, and space sharks are out there keeping it low. Maybe the memories of everyone were erased about the second Primarch because no one could know about his mission. But that is just my theory, because the whole thing about Korax exiling them is just too mundane. God, I hope my theory is true. It would be awesome. As you probably noticed, all of these chapters have some type of tragic, bizarre, or just straight up bloody backstory. And I think this is enough clarification why they were selected to be Pentarchy of Blood. Either way, let me know down in the comments which one of these is your favorite. Or maybe you would change the lineup, and if so, which chapter would you replace and which ones you would introduce in Pentarchy? Let's talk about it. If you enjoy my video, then please leave a like and remember to subscribe to my channel so you wouldn't miss my latest upload. But for now, I'll see you next time, nerd.